keep you your, your attention on this uh, talk. So here is um, our developer for um, our, our part of our suite of visualization tools. This is Nick Earl. He's a research assistant. I'm um, sorry, research and instrument analyst. He went to grad schools in the fall, and he's so good. And he built a tool called Spetis, which I will show a, a video of right now. So in in PyQT, um, and here we are reading in um, a spectrum, generic um, file, uh, and you see that it is pretty much placement for SPLOT, because as I'll explain later, IRAP is going by the wayside. Um, and basically, um, you're able to on the spectrum, and you know, you here you can change the axes. You're changing the top to velocity. You can change it to redshift, whatever you need. Um, sorry, I have funny feedback. Um, we are changing the units. Again, from Jansky's to ergs per angstrom per centimeter squared per second. And you can now also do measurements of these emission lines. So you look at the top right on the box here. Um, the numbers are changing. That's just a kind uh, of an update. Now it's fit to this line here. So you can to fit to, I'm sorry, referring to this line, you're going to do a line and then mark the continuum with the side shades. And we'll release for specs is on Friday. Um, it's going to be an intro release to people at Space Telescope, but do drop us a line if you would like a release for yourself. Um, we, we can then provide that. with documentation. And in here you works on different layers. You can read in and out. Um, we're now going to fit a, a model here to this without saying finally. You can read in and out your fist, read in and out your, your data. Um, and it uses a lot of the, the astrohi um, fitters here. Yeah, you could you know do fun things like change the color of your model and then zoom in and see how well it fits. Now we're gonna save. So migrate model and then dip in. And delete in again. And we're using this. You can also um, add models together. So we're constant one minus the Gaussian. We're going to update that and move it down. In your model arithmetic, you can make complex models to add it to your data in a good way. Okay. Look at the range. Many more people have joined us online. If you just joined us, can you please remember to mute uh, while Susan's talking, and then we'll break in about 10 minutes or so and ask for questions from the audience. But there are people online I see right now that uh, are not muted. If you don't mute yourself, I'm going to try to mute you in about a minute. Thank you. So that's a short demo of our 1D spectral analysis visualization tool that we built uh, here in a matter of, I think it was two, two week coding sprints. And now we're just working this week to get a release 
So that was some candy for you. And now we're going to go straight to the overview, the outline of the talk. First, I'm going to do the overview. Um, then we're going to tell you how we decided or how we're deciding what to develop, ask for input from you. Um, then we're going to do some development, show you how we're doing development via coding sprints. I'm going to tell you what a coding sprint is. And we're going to look at some videos of the visualization tools. The, the talk peppered throughout with videos of these visualization tools, but at the end I have um, kept a few there to keep them together. So I'm watching. Okay. So some overview. This is about JWST post pipeline data analysis tools. So there are going to be pipelines that reduce your death. Um, this is what you do afterwards. Most, so most of the effort here at Space Telescope goes into the pipelines themselves. Um, and this effort in comparison is smaller. So JWST users need to inspect, manipulate, and model their data. Their analysis will be in the Python slash AstroPy. Um, basic capabilities will be there, such as familiar that uses IRAF, IDL, FDAS, FDAS will be available. Many already are. Unfortunately, IRAF, neither IRAF nor DS9 is currently supported, and they're both in obsolete languages, as, as many of you know. Um, IRAF is compiled on ancient machines, and it's, a, it's quite an effort to keep it going. Um, so it does need to be replaced. Um, visualization will be in Glue and Ginga, which I will speak about in a bit. Um, but first, I will show you a Ginga video. Ginga is a really cool visualization tool being developed by um, Subaru. And we've been on and have done uh, a little bit of work trying to get it um, working with our stuff, and we've been so impressed. Um, our lead developer on this is Paleon Lim. She's in the science software branch here. And I'm going to show you a video of the Ginga visualization tool. So add in, I think this is like a Spitzer image, an I, I, like an IRAP image. Um, and you can see it's not all that dissimilar from DS9, which we all know and love. Um, and, but it interacts in Python, uh, and it's written in Python, so it's more modern by far. You don't worry about um, using AMP or anything. Um, so here, um, there's a um, pretty self-explanatory. We're going to read in the FITS file. Even one in Spitzer. So the, I'm sorry, there's now two FITS files loaded. You can see on the bottom left, there's a cutout to that. That's basically the region where that little um, cyan box is. Now, being around that little cyan box and seeing how um, the Im comparing the images in the two different links on the bottom left, the little postage stamp there. Now we're reading another image. It's this object here, and it in many different wavelengths. creating a few of its very tools. Just show a contour map and the stats page over here, um, the full attack max this. Um, okay, flavor page of how the Gigaver operates, um, and we will be using it for um, development in Gigaver's lab. Okay, so. Um, can I ask a question? question? Sure, it is. Um, could you describe what added functionalities the Ginga? module might have over DS9? Aside from Wait, we're going to that's the thing that it's written in Python. It's written in a modern language. We're trying to incorporate uh, and what happens is they're prioritized during the sprint. So we have a coding sprint I'll explain to you, which is a two-week intensive coding. Um, 
a coding time in which we meet up every day and decide what goes on there. Um, at the first day, we actually prioritize what we'd like in there. Uh, um, it was driven by the people who are doing the sprint. That first sprint on, on was to see whether it was feasible, whether we can get in there a few things that we know and love from S9 and look at its functionality for large images. So the one thing that, you know, is a real question for the community, what in these visualization tools do you want? I mean, we have lists and lists of these things, but um, we would like your help in prioritizing just that. Excuse me. Your question. Basically, you tell us. Uh, otherwise, we have prioritized lists we're just going to walk through. <laughs> uh, help us prioritize those lists. Okay, data C post pipeline data analysis tools. Tools to understand you with see data structures, including uncertainties, very important, detector geometries, data associations, and data quality flags. Um, basic tools will have a consistent Python API and command line interface. Um, extensible visualization tools are being developed for interactive workflows, which I've shown demonstrations of. So, I mean, Python, no more IRAF, no more IEL. So, if you guys are newbies to Python, I encourage you to take, you know, one of those online Python courses, or if your, your institute does offer a Python course, please take it. And then we also are running data analysis workshops here, so keep an eye on our website and the emails from the institute about these. We've already run, we ran one that was very successful. We had people who are just starting in Python um, and did a lot of workshopy work with them to get them up to speed. And you can, I'll, I'll show you later, you can also start to download the Glue visualization tool and work with that. Um, we've been using that for a lot of our um, visualization tools. Okay, so deciding what to develop. Um, how do you do this? Um, we, we established a data analysis development forum comprised of people with Space Telescope and then some people from outside. We collect and analyze a total of 31 use cases for James Webb. So, do those in a moment. And we commonalities amongst those use cases and look for tools that people um, used and prioritize the tools from much like you need to have this tool. <laughs> you need to have a tool that does photometry. Too nice to have. Like, that's a great tool, but it, 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 people can do without it for now. Um, and then we decided what to develop given those resources. We put an emphasis on modular, modular scriptable tools to enable customization. We plan, plan implementation, implementation via coding sprints, which I'll talk about in a moment. And they did training and community feedback. We had a workshop at the AAF and there and the year before. And then um, we had a data analysis workshop in May, and we're hoping for one in the fall. Okay. Also, we would like to know what you would want. We, we, we would, we're always trying to get information from the community. So please leave me a note if there are some tools that you think are really, really important for your research. Um, let me know, and we will um, add them to the list. So here's these are the use cases that I am um, talk about. Um, we went and took the different modes of James Webb and different in high high popular use cases we would say from that um, are it's called the SVRM and um, looking at all like the, the modes of James Webb and we came up with a bunch of everything from crowded field imaging to IFU spectroscopy of a nearby galaxy to long long slit spectroscopy transit and eclipse spectroscopy. Okay. Uh, and we also put some generic tasks like sky fitting, subtraction, PSF matching, artificial noise injection and recovery, and then some use cases with the visualization tool that we were we are adopting. Um, interactively optimizing PSF, so on and so forth. But we would really like to hear back from you guys. And then help them via coding sprints. And then I'll give you a listing of the coding sprints, then I'll explain exactly what a coding sprint is. Okay. So far we've completed 12 coding sprints during which important infrastructure decisions were made and done. Um, you've seen those videos were the outputs of some of the coding sprints. Um, for example, one the interactive spectral analysis, you saw that was the first video. Um, image utilities, Imerith, Instat, et cetera. Non-interactive fitting of 1D spectra, um, signal processing, tools for compute, and you'll see a video on that. We did two of those. Um, the, we did. Uh, we have a MOS tool, a tool for multi-object spectroscopy. 
um, to visualization, um, release preparations for Astro and tools, parameter files, PSF and PSF kernel tools, 1D interactive spectral tools. Uh, a second front on that. So you see this is a mix of bread and you know, the, the hardcore AstroPy tools that we need in there. Um, and then also um, some visualization tools um, make life so much easier. For example, when you have a ton of MOS spectra and images and you need to sort through them. Okay. The upcoming sprint schedule, or I should say it's well, starting here in uh, January 2016, going all the way out to the fall. And you can see, um, you know, for example, in June, we're going to do another sprint on the MOS tools. Um, it'd be great if you're able to call into that, at least the first setup meeting, which I'll explain what that is in a moment, just to help us prioritize the things that you think are most important for your particular research, the things you think are most important for, the, for your field. And then releases we had our first tools release in 2015. It's an 0.2 release. And Aston tools release, it's 0.1. Um, and this year, we're going to have a SpecVis release. Uh, first, we can do it internally and then open it to you guys. But please send a lot, uh, an email if you'd like to be one of our testers. Um, and then um, we're going to hope we're going to release the MOS tool we're building called MOSVIS and the Cube tool we're building called, called Cube Tool. Um, plus, after Glue and Ginga releases. And in the future, you know, past the fall, well, into the fall, into the winter, um, spectral fitting of non resample data, image, and spectral geometry, registration, resampling, um, synthetic photometry, um, using to do the inspection of all the JWST ramps that you heard of in, um, hopefully, in the near tech talk, and visualization of associated resampled and non resampled data. So you back to this website again, and now you can make a little bit more sense out of it to see what these things are. And you can show all our packages under development, everything from, you know, Glue, AstroPy, Ginga, which are the main um, vehicles, I would say, to PhotoUtils, AstroImmuTils, um, things to spherical geometry, ImExam, and then Spectral Visual Suite, um, Specs, MOSVIS, CubeVis, PyPhot, uh, and on and so forth. And um, with many of these, you can download them and play around and send us back. So now I'll show you another fun thing. This is Viz. This is another tool developed by Nick, um, a, who can be your graduate student, who is absolutely amazing. Um, and this is a Viz tool. I think we had two, two week sprints on this guy. So we, you see we have a bunch of test data there in those directories. We're opening up a manga. Data Cube, courtesy David Law, we have permission to show it for demonstration purposes, and we're now um, scrubbing through Cube. It's a galaxy. Um, the galaxy. Um, display. Now we're the spectrum. Spectrum laps over the cube. Now I surveyed people at a, at a conference where I've used one of their biggest things in a wish list is we want the spectrum selected area on the galaxy that's a special shape. Like, I want to get that spiral arm in there. I want the spectrum of that. Um, and then we made it such that you could do that. And there you see the, uh, the green spectrum there is of the spiral arm. The red is of the uh, nuclear, the, the area of the nucleus. And the black is the total. Um, your version of SpecVis that's been incorporated here. It's just a little clunkier, um, but um, at our new version or new version of Cube Tools, uh, we'll have a sprint on hopefully this summer. We'll incorporate this version of SpecVis. I'm just going to to this. the error bars on the data, I think those are fake. But we keep error bars in everything we do. And the leapers again for this are Nick Earl and also Jonathan Eisenheimer, who's an SS speaker. So just a reminder, we, we encourage you to join us. Um, uh, set priorities for each package during hour long kickoff meetings. Um, and um, for the ambitious participate in our development, um, please email this 
um, put yourself on this email list here, um, and you'll receive notices of when we're starting and stopping the sprint. Okay, so before any further, I should probably ask for questions now because that went rather quickly. Yes, ask for questions. Does anybody in line have questions for Susan? Do you have questions? Yep, Ben. Uh, so my question is, how can we apply these tools to other missions other than JWST? And really, that's two things. What part of these tools is, uh, I assume there's a module that's aware of JWST properties, so assuming that would be changed for different experiments? Could you repeat this? Hold on. Hold on. Could you repeat that after that? After that? So the question is split into two parts. Which bit of the codes are instrument aware? And then if I'm on a different instrument, are there kind of data structures, say for masks, that, and standards like that I could adopt that would make it easier to use these tools? I'm trying to keep in mind that you can apply this to any other data set. Okay. Yeah, so we're trying to keep it as agnostic as possible. And if you have data design, we encourage you to call into the I'm sorry, I'm back, but you can come to the initial step for the sprint and remind us that say, okay, um, this is so crucial for Spitzer, for example. I really need to show my ALMA data when I look at this cube. Um, and so you keep the hooks in there. Um, we have been, you know, we will have documentation. We hope that the community will take this on and will help. We'll also develop it out for other um, other missions. We can go to phase, start putting in, you know. All these Spitzer centric things because we're just not, we don't have money to do that. But um, this is something we are definitely, definitely keeping in mind is the multi wavelength aspect. But is, is that already documented? Is that uh, just a, you know, attention right now? It's in it right now. We hope to keep it in the documentation. We're still very much in the early stages. But, you know, we'd love it if you called in and, and remind us. This is key for my my Chandra stuff drawing. So no, it's, I mean it's not coming the documentation yet. Many a lot of times we haven't even worked out what the what the web formats will look like. I think that's only coming now as the pipelines are really um, kind of uh, cleaning everything up. So a lot is pretty agnostic, and we hope a lot of it. And I'm sorry for the discourse, but we hope a lot of it will work with your ground-based data, will work with your Hubble data, your pre-existing data you have on disk, so you can use it now. I mean, I'm using the tools now with data that are certainly not from James Webb. So we had the Manga data there for the cube. I also downloaded some data from, from a number of other instruments, including KMOS and the Muse. Muse is it now, <laughs> but um, hopefully it won't in the future. Okay. Further questions? Thanks, Susan. Questions? Online. For the, if you're online, you need to unmute if you're going to speak. Just wait uh, 10 seconds before we move on. You by hitting that little microphone button. Okay, so go on. Okay, so what is a coding sprint? I've been mentioning this throughout. Sprints are when we get developers and astronomers in the room, and we just what we're going to develop, and we continually update that as things are developed. So it's real-time development rather than writing a ton of requirements, sending that off, and iterating on them as things are built. Um, so we start with a kickoff meeting. Um, where we sit there for an hour, we choose as many experts in the room as possible for the tool that we're developing. So say doing something on MOS spectroscopy, I've been slowly, you know, trolling the hallway saying, okay, who works in MOS spectroscopy? Trying to get them in the room and then calling my colleagues and saying, hey, we'd like to get you calling on this. And then people like you from, um, from the community at conferences we've spoken at or we've run into um, bring visits to universities. And got or your institutes and gotten call in, and we've been very successful in getting that running. Um, 
we, we end up what's called the Trello board, where we list everything that we'd like to develop, and then we sit there and have it out and say, okay, what do we really need to develop? And then every we have a tag up meeting that you may or may not need to or want to attend, but we meet with the developers and we keep things flowing. A lot of project management involves making sure they have the resources they need and the people who um, have this, the right task, the right skills for the project have the time for it, um, and if not getting their time. Um, and then at the end, we set, we solely, we do iterate on what is feasible debate and what we would like to develop. Sometimes we end up developing more, sometimes we end up developing less. And at the end, we set up um, acceptance criteria for the sprint, and then we do a demo video generally or um, uh, a live a live demo to the ADF, which is the list um, I sent you up. Of, I, I spoke about earlier. So development through sprints. We really want the community excuse me, input from you guys. Um, code sprints, like I said, last two weeks with prep before and after and continuing work pending um, availability. So we do a little prep work before um, developers up to speed on what tools are currently out there. Um, use the agile development paradigm, which I which we have hacked a bit, um, and we have actor user involvement. Um, this fosters communication between the software developers and the scientists, and we develop a very nice rapport. Um, and they have rapid prototyping, so we build, and we test it. Let's have a look at it. Let's see how things are going. Oh, it breaks here. Uh, this is not working, you know. And they fix it almost immediately the next day, and then iterative development, very similar. So guiding principles of these, these tool development is that we are hoping, we want everything to be, everything <clears throat> will be open source. Um, we, everything will be easy to install. And part of that is that it's well documented. So we're trying to make sure that each of our sprints is, is documented cleanly and clearly. Um, it works on, we, that these, uh, we, hope, we want these uh, tools to run multiple interfaces, um, built on stable, widely adopted languages, stable, we adopted code libraries, and leveraging existing codes and algorithms where possible. So if you, for example, built a fitting code to fit your AGN spectrum with a ton of like, templates with a ton of um, many different functions, and you'd like that written in Python, but this is an example of Jerry Chris's coding sprint. Uh, and, you know, we basically did that. We, we, we built that out for people, and that was the result of one of our coding sprints. And I've been hitting you over the head with this a lot, but just a reminder. <laughs> um, so calling to the hour-long kickoff is great. And the reason why you should do this is, um, yes, you are an expert in your area of research. It's a little silly. Um, even grad students, believe it or not, you are. And grad students tend to know the latest and greatest in terms of tools, which is wonderful. Um, and you will likely be using these tools. So this is your chance to make sure that the most important features are implemented. Rather than five years down you know, line, when you're working with James Webb Dave, you're like, gosh, why don't they have the most obvious thing in this tool? Well, then if you call into the sprints, because sometimes, you know, I'm not an expert in all fields, we will miss it. Um, it's only an hour, and then we're nice. Um, you can call in remotely. We, we um, will work with your time zone, um, and we're, um, I say we're very collegial. Let's just put it in, in, the, in the proper sense. We're very collegial. You can call, we're not going to yell at you. We're going to really listen to your input. Um, and then I encourage you to get on the mailing list to be part of this. Just some more notes just to remind you, I'm not going to show it again, but this is the SpecViz, our 1D spec visualization tool. Um, this is CubeViz, which uses SpecViz, so our cube visualization tool for IFU data cubes. And then this is MOSFIS, and playing the video. It's Clue G, because I made it. And it's a messy desktop. Here we go. Um, this is using the Glue, um, the Glue visualization tool. We did, I think, one sprint on this. <laughs> and so I'm using a MOSFIS tool, a model blog. It's a table of my data. So imagine I got spectra of a region. Extra galactic, or in uh, you know, say a local stormy region, and multiple spectra. This is using the micro shuttle array, which is our, our MOS. And I'm, I have the spectra, I have all the, the individual objects of those spec that I took spectra of. And on the right, I'm plotting the RA versus DEC. 
very simple slide. I'm going to bring in my mouse tool, my mouse viewer. So we hack this to be actually test vector from James Webb from near SAC along an ACS image. So we linked each AC, you know, postage stamp from the ACS image to James Webb Spectrum. And here's the postage stamp of a galaxy. We pretend it was an extra galactic field. That's linked to the 2D spectrum, which is the window on the top that's next to the postage stamp. They are linked spatially, even though it's a little funkier. <laughs> um, the spectrum is so small. Uh, and then the 1D spectrum, our spec is, is shown on the bottom here. The idea of this is a quick look explorer. You go through each of these targets. You can select them in the array index space. You can select them in an image. You can select them in the table. You can sort the table and then say, I only want the ones at the very top. Here, you're playing around with the spectrum, showing the data quality flag, showing the errors. And you can see the 2D spectrum on the top is linked to the 1D spectrum on the bottom. And the idea is that you want to uh, eventually write notes on each object and read them out. We did an encoding sprint on this for two weeks, so this is more of um, um, getting it running. Okay, and this is actually, so that spec is that's in the spectral viewer, the one viewer that's in the mouse tool is very basic. Here we are loading it into, there's a button you can touch that will move, move you out into the full version of the spec is. So you can make a lot more measurements on it. Whereas off tool viewer is very just quick fit, quick view. And we hope another sprint on this in June, so please stay in touch. Here we're just fitting noise in the spectrum for fun. But how powerful this can be when you have, you know, tens of thousands of spectra to go through. Um, I know I had a student to write the tool in two months, so here, here you go. Um, it's, it's a ready to tool. Sorry, that off a bit. But well, I'm going to move you on to some of the 3D viewers that we've been working with, closely with Tom Robotai, who's been a, a real great lead on this. Um, Tom Robotai's email is at the bottom if you'd like to contact him about this or give your input. Um, this is done in the glue visualization tool, and on the bottom here is the web address for glue, and this is a very nice picture of pump. And then without further ado, this is actually a near spec IFU test data cube, a simulated data cube. So it's like a test cube with some simulated data on it, I believe. Um, I got this from Pierre. Here, I'll talk to you guys in last week, and here we're playing around with that data cube. So this is similar to, to Cubus, but we're um, in the process of, say, merging the two. And it's a 3D data cube with, like, a continuum source down the middle. <laughs> and you can highlight it and play around with it and spin it. Histograms in terms of um, data numbers or uh, errors. Like, you want to look at higher stuff. Where are they? There. Or the flag things. Where are they? And they're just moving, um, scrubbing through the cube, slice by slice, on the upper right there. Okay. What's nice about glue is that you can not only use cubes 3D, but you can put in data sets. So I took my random high galaxy kinematics data set from the D2 survey um, that I had on disk at the time, and then simply plotted it in 3D. Um, here we are looking at different coordinates. We're looking at U minus B versus um, redshift and mass. So the three dimensions of that 3D cube are in the bottom left. It's redshift, um, mass, and then minus i. And then I color-coded it for the fourth dimension. Hold on, Susan. We're getting some kind of feedback. I just reset. Okay. We just uh, rewind 30 seconds or so. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. I didn't hear. I just heard funny at the end. Okay. So instead of just reading IFU data cubes to 
um, glue to in a 3D in a 3D sense with you can set, put in your large data set. Um, here I have a data set that is in three dimensions. You don't need to know what these are, but essentially redshift, mass, and um, R minus I color. And here I'm color coding according to absolute U minus B, just to play around the data. On up, I have the R and deck of the field. This is higher redshift galaxies. Each point is galaxy. You have a 2D plot in, on the right-hand side in R and B minus R, and I'm highlighting some galaxies, and those galaxies get highlighted in the 3D cube and in the, um, uh, the image. You can see this can be very powerful in exploring data sets. Um, it's like a fancy top cat, but works in fun. You can put stuff in. Um, it, it's very useful. Um, this work done by Tom Robitaille again. Here I am, we are selecting in RIN deck. Um, you pick up those purple points, and you see those purple points show up in both the 2D plot on the right and the uh, 3D plot on the left. You can know where the AGN are in this color space, and you just select those. Okay, there they are in the 3D space, um, so on and so forth. So they're a very powerful tool for interacting very quickly with large data sets. I'm sending grad students off to make a thousand plots. And then looking at them up to the window, <laughs> this is a lot easier. This is a, 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 a pre-summary slide, um, just to give you everything together in one slide for you um, and make you glaze over slightly. But um, on the left, we so the post pipeline data tools encompass these bubbles here, um, being AstroPy, everything from data formats, file in and out, tables, parameter files, coordinate WCS, dates and times. Workflow is using the IPython Jupyter Notebooks, using Google Visualization Tool, and then bottom using the Python libraries, NumPy, SciPy, so on and so forth. And on the upper left, the visualization and interaction tools, the Viz Suite, the SpecViz, MossViz, QViz that you saw, um, exam, and plugin for the Ginga viewer. Uh, that is FOT use tools or flexible modular tools. For detection, segmentation, and measurement, and also multi-frame analysis. Simon these fits to multiple unresampled images. Um, and then look under the hood. I encourage you to go to our site, bit.do forward slash jbst underscore dadf, and um, have a look at where we're going. Um, we'll say a little bit what we've done already, and to have help us with where we're going, send us an email um, to this list. Um, a bit low traffic, and we'd love to hear from you, um, especially in those one-hour kickoffs of the coding sprint. Okay, all I have. So I would encourage any questions. Is anything? Just one one question, Lisa. Um, you had mentioned um, is that, that you're still going to have a you know zero point one release of the um, the the spec is or I forgot at the beginning. Is that coming out soon? Yes. Yeah, so we're, yeah, like, we're doing it this Friday for in, in the building, but um, definitely send me an email if you want to um, be included in that. Um, the idea is that yeah, I, I call it testing in the onion skin model. So you, you first test with your friends, so you're not getting nasty emails from people saying, oh, my God, it crashed. And then you test with maybe more friends, like my friends at uh, you, part of DADF. And then you release it to the community, um, just so we can get all the bugs out. I think a lot of the work, and many of you know this, um, I'm somewhat new to this, in releasing this code is in testing it and, and making sure everything is smooth in the documentation and in terms of bugs and things. Okay. I'm sorry. I was just saying thank you. Okay. I know tools are at different stages, but do you have um, ambitions on packaging? Like, going to be on Conda? Yeah. So that's the idea. So you want to distribute it through AstroConda, which is run through here. I end up hosting significant development infrastructure, such as continuous integration and repos? I don't I am the, I don't know for sure. 
you an email, I can find out for you. Okay, thank you all for joining us today. Thank you, uh, Susan, for taking the time to show us what's going on with JWC development. Uh, and we'll be back in June for the last talk of the lecture series that with Mary with uh, George Rigi giving the talk. Mm -hmm. And as usual, Susan's slides will be posted online. I'll send out um, an email with the location as well as the recording. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.